Hi. So, let's get a clicker on actually. That's probably a good place to, to start. I'm Martin Underhill. Um, this is my first time in Sunland City Centre. I was uh, greeted and taken from the, the, the platform at the Metro by Mr. Proctor and, uh, and directed over here. I must say, I was impressed. So uh, <laughs> thank you for, thanks for coming along and thanks for being so welcoming. Um, I am uh, one third of Front End NE. Um, we're running a conference, so if anyone wants to get themselves tickets for that, go ahead. It's going to be, it's looking like a good one. Uh, I'm also an interaction designer. Um, work at Orange Bus, that's supposed to be an orange bus. It's some kind of bus, it looks more like a Belgian bus, I don't know, like a flag of some sort. Um, but yeah, I work in central government in the digital delivery centre. Um, and I care very much about uh, products and uh, how they're built and how they're designed. So I'm going to be focusing on, um, I guess, these three areas uh, to sort of give you an idea as to what I think how or how accessibility should be viewed, what it is, why it's important, and some tips and tricks. Um, just a bit of background before I dive into examples, basically. Um, and I'm, I think I, I believe I'm kind of standing on the shoulder, shoulders of uh, Craig Abbott, who's already, I don't know if you went along to, was anyone along at, at um, Craig's talk? It was kind of a, more about the sort of how accessibility is generally. So I'll, I'll cover it briefly in the first two parts there as well, uh, before I get into kind of nitty gritty. Um, it's going to be web focused, so I guess it is everybody or most people involved in web development, web design, or something like that, in some in some sort. Yeah, we're uh, so it's going to be very web focused, and it's also going to be form centric uh, because uh, I mean I'm not, but essentially I'm a I'm a form designer up at HMRC. So uh, sorry, I don't think I can say that. I'm, but he's already broken the uh, broken the secret. So yeah, um, but yeah, that's so that's what I do every day. This is the little word that people use for accessibility. Um, it's an A, just in case anybody didn't know this, because I didn't know this. Um, it's an A and a Y with 11 letters in between. So accessibility. So if you ever see, ever see that, don't feel daft. Um, it's an inaccessible word for accessibility. Um, it's kind of one of those things that demonstrates the, 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 the exact opposite of what it should. Uh, that's better, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Accessibility spelt in its full. Um, there was a, quite an interesting article um, on CSS tricks a week or so ago, uh, where he pointed that, where, where Chris Coyer pointed that out, and I said, like, "Yeah, of course." The, the number of articles that you must miss, or, or I definitely missed, because I just saw the A11Y and thought, "Well, doesn't look like anything that I'd be interested in." Uh, when in actual fact, it's the opposite. So. Um, what, what stops people accessing your, your content? Um, what's an impairment uh, and what does that mean? Um, disability is a word that might not be quite appropriate. Um, and I'll explain why. There is a very traditional way of viewing um, disability and that is the medical model of disability. What that does, um, it, it's uh, the person is disabled because they have an impairment. The person is disabled be because they have some kind of impairment which disables them, is the idea. Um, so that's the kind of base base foundation. Um, on top of that, the idea that anybody can have some kind of impairment. It doesn't have to be a medical disability. It can be you can be impaired in a different way. And uh, Microsoft uh, have a you can you see the little link at the bottom there. Um, check that out. It's quite a, quite a good resource for for anybody interested in this and uh, digging into this. Um, the idea is you get a permanent disability, which is something, well, I'll get into what that might be, uh, a temporary disability, or you can have a situational disability. Um, is, it, is everybody familiar with this sort of idea? Is, is it anybody? Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go into it anyway. So you've got the uh, permanent on the left, temporary in the middle, and then you've got the situational on the right-hand side. So this chap on the right has one arm, this chap, so that's permanent. The guy in the middle has uh, an arm injury, so he's out of action temporarily. And um, this is a new parent here. 
um, who can't use one of her arms because she's got the baby in that arm. So that's at that moment, these people have effectively the same um, impairment. Same thing with uh, non-sighted users, uh, might be somebody who is um, medically um, blind, then you've got the, the middle ground where you've got somebody, somebody who's got cataracts, then you've got this distracted driver, they can't look at your, your content, so they have to have it read to them in some way. Um, finally, just to touch on this, I might have taken a little bit of liberty with the, with the fella on the right there. It just a bit, I think it was a Viking, but I thought it was probably appropriate to, to introduce some kind of ethnic uh, element there. Um, I'm Scottish, by the way. <laughs> uh, so you've got um, non-verbal, you've got someone with laryngitis, who looks suspiciously like uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, um, Gary Oldman, um, and then you've got someone with a heavy accent who might not be able to be understood outside of their uh, region or, uh, or, or country. Um, the point is uh, that that can be extended even further, so any user can be disabled. And it's, so it's not just people with permanent, temporary, or situational impairments, it's anybody. And, I'll, I, and you might be thinking, well, come on, like, you're, 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 take, you're just, this is going a bit too far, but uh, let me explain. There is another uh, model of disability which goes beyond the, the medical model. It's the social model of disability. Uh, and this is much more uh, inclusive, much more interesting. Um, what it does is it says that the disability moves the location of the dis disability out of the person and onto the social, into social structures. Um, and social perceptions, attitudes, institutions, and policies all contribute to the creation of a disability. So, so the idea of um, somebody, a, a designer like me or a developer, might go out and act, or, or an, an architect is probably a good, a good, uh, a good example. Somebody can design actively design something which prohibits somebody get, getting into a building uh, unless they think about that as they're designing. Like how does somebody in a wheel? How does a wheelchair user? get into this building, um, can't be steps, so we have to have some kind of alternatives. Uh, that might be something that everybody accesses, or it might be, a, might be something that's a, an addition. Um, so that's the idea of, of, of it's the lack of, it's the lack of um, uh, accommodation or uh, design flaws that stop your museum, your software center being accessible by everybody. Um, so individuals with an impairment are disabled by society's failure to build, on, uh, build an inclusive environment. Moving on to who might be responsible for this, um, it's kind of everybody right through the chain um, from brand and graphic designers, people that decide on typography, people that decide on color schemes, color contrast, all that kind of thing. Uh, you've got user experience designers, uh, that might be the interaction designers like me, it might be content designers. Um, have we got any UX designers in tonight? We have one, two. We're, uh, yes, yeah, so it's one of those things that, 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 that those people can be responsible. Front end developers are probably the most obvious. Have we got any front end devs in? We got one. <laughs> I'm wondering what you all do. <laughs> the, yeah. So um, front end developers, kind of the, the most obvious one, HTML and all that kind of thing, just making sure that your, your content is accessible. Um, it extends to back end developers and DevOps and all that kind of thing as well. Server response times, all that kind of thing. Uh, all helps um, in the sort of journey to, to make your content accessible to people. Um, but why should we care? I guess the first one is there's a legal ob obligation. Uh, the services I work on in the government um, digital center uh, must be accessible to everyone who needs them. Um, if not, there's a possible breach of the Equality Act 2010. Um, and there's a there's a hard deadline on that. I think it's 2020 at some point where that becomes um, a huge problem. And, and it's one of those things that it's only going to get tighter as far as I'm concerned. Um, so you might have a legal ob obligation um, to make your sites accessible. You might also consider money. Um, Money drives a lot of things. If if you can make more money by making your content accessible to more people, then uh, then that can only be a good thing. Uh, but for me, it just comes down to being a decent human being. Um, if you make your content accessible to as many people 
then you're not excluding anybody and uh, that's that's only going to be a good thing. Um, I guess a lot of you might be saying, yeah, but um, why do, if there's so much at stake, why do we do it? Why do we make our sites accessible? Um, so something that a lot of people say is that it's expensive. I would argue the opposite. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't say it was necessarily cheaper, but I would say it was the same. Uh, if you've considered accessibility from the very start, then it's, it's in there. It becomes part of um, what you do. You don't have to retrofit anything. We're doing that at the moment uh, with a few things, and it's just taking so much time to get to get things accessible that have already been built. Um, so expense uh, isn't really an issue if you think about it from the start. Um, some people might say that it looks good. Um, I don't think that really washes. I don't know. It's a that's one of those ones that stakeholders are probably going to kick back a lot on, but really the the practical benefits of it outweigh the the how pretty something might be. And I'll get to some ideas of what things might be done to make things pretty that, that actually have a detrimental effect on your users. Uh, and the other thing, which is actually a very good reason, is that you didn't know um, how to make this particular thing more accessible. So hopefully I can help to a very small extent uh, uh, with with that, um, so some common mistakes and how to fit them, uh, fix them. This is uh, this is the sort of the 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 the, the main uh, part of the, the talk. I'm going to give some code examples here. Um, there may or may not be some pictures of kittens in there. So if if you're not into HTML or CSS or anything like that, then uh, don't worry. There's going to there will be a payoff at the end of it. Um, my first bugbear, my biggest bugbear, um, with certainly with forms, um, maybe overall, uh, the first thing that I wrote when I was writing this presentation was a placeholder for labels. Um, that might be gibberish, but what it means is, um, well, I'll take this example. This is a website that some of you might know. Um, you've got, uh, kind of difficult to see, but there's an outline here of the box. So you've got two boxes. Um, one box has this, label inside of it. Um, the next one has the label inside of it as well. And when you start typing over the top of that, that text disappears and what you type appears. So I guess this is an example of where somebody might think I'm saving some space in the UI and um, keeping it nice and condensed. Um, but there's a number of reasons why why that's not so good. I guess the first one is for, if the, the, for well, screen readers are the obvious one. You have inconsistent support for that um, depending on what screen reader you're using. Um, the other issue is uh, on a more kind of every everybody level. Um, if you start typing into that first one, you might think, oh, what was that typing again? Was it, was it an email? Was it a username? I forget. They're asking you for a lot. Um, you might start typing and then forget what you were going to be typing. Uh, and by that point, it's disappeared. So you've got to delete what you were typing, have a look at what it said again, and then start typing. So it's just these these inconveniences that, that, that are put in front of you. Um, that's what it would look like in terms of the code boiled right down. So you've got two um, text inputs. The first, or you've got two, two inputs. Um, the first one's a text, the second one's a password. The first one there has the placeholder of phone, email, or username. The second one has the placeholder of password. Uh, and that's what not to do. This is how I would fix it. Again, it's kind of difficult to see. Um, color contrast wise, Twitter have failed. Uh, it's uh, there is that that box that goes around there underneath the the phone email or username and the same with password. So what I've done there is I've hacked hacked the page and I've I've moved the um the, the text that was a placeholder out of the input and as a label um, that sits just above the input so it's always visible. So when you start typing, you know exactly what you're typing. You can refer back to that. Um, and then there's no issue with screen readers because that's all stuff that's baked in. That's HTML and that's been like that for, for years and years and years. Um, and that's how I would code it. Again, very boiled down. Um, you've got the first one there on the top, second one on the bottom. You've got a label, then an input. And instead of having a, a, a placeholder on the input, I've moved that into the label. Um, and I've, and I've um, tied the label and input together with the for username and the ID username there. So that it knows those two are, are part of the same thing. Um, second bugbear 
uh, labels that look like placeholders. Um, it's kind of kind of along similar grounds. Uh, this is the BBC's um, Global Experience Language um, Pattern Library. Uh, there's some examples from that. Um, these are both, um, I guess, color contrast better here from a, for, from from the from the off. Um, <laughs> But you've, what you've got is you've got the label there sitting inside the or on top of the, the field that you're going to be typing into. Uh, when you click into it or tab into it, um, the the label lifts up and to the left and uh, and, and gets a little bit smaller. Um, so it takes up a little bit of extra space, but not too much. So it's kind of it looks a bit like a compromise. Um, I would argue that that's still not a perfect solution. Um, First of all, does the field label and the line underneath of it, does that look clickable necessarily? It may be if you know the system, you're used to that, but as far as kind of conventions, it's, it's not ideal. Um, when you click into it, the, uh, the field label there pops up to the left, gets smaller. Um, that might cause problems with people who, who need to have that text at a certain minimum size. So making it smaller might just make it illegible to them. Um, I, it also uses a little bit of JavaScript. I mean, you can do it with CSS and HTML on its own. Um, in doing that, you've got to play about with the source order a little bit, so you can use adjacent sibling selectors and stuff. It's a it's it's a lot of engineering uh, and, and overthinking for something that could just be sorted by having a label then an input. Um, again, I think this is one of those things where people think it looks a little bit sexy, so um, they go with that. Um, hint text is a placeholder. This is sort of on the better side of, of bad, um, I, I don't really have that much of a problem with this, but you do see it quite a lot, where you have the, this is this is looking good so far, you've got the label above the input, uh, color contrast better, so we can see it on this, on this uh, projector. Um, what you've got, you've got some hint text inside the, the input, so as soon as you start typing again, that's gonna disappear. Um, I would, again, I've just moved that, on, you know, between the label and the input, so you can go through that, linear, what am I doing, how do I format what I'm doing, and then um, then type it. I would probably go a little bit further and get rid of that creepy, uh, it'll be our secret thing as well, because, yeah, you know. Um, source order, I touched on that very briefly, um, with the text, the, 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 the input, that, uh, that the, the, the label that pops up to the left when you start typing. Um, I'll cover hint text after the input um, first. That's uh, that's this idea where if you're coming to this as a non-sighted user using a screen reader, you get to the input, the notifications, uh, or whatever that might be, whatever the label might be there, and then you start typing your password as it may, might be. Um, once you've typed your password, you then find out your password is not valid when you, when you come off of that because it tells you afterwards. To me, that would be a lot more useful to have before you start type in your password. Um, again, that's more of a non-sighted screen reader user type situation, but nonetheless, very much worth considering. Um, I, another issue with with, um, with that kind of thing, with the, the order of things in the HTML, you've got parts of the form after the submit button, and I'll go back to Twitter, um, that same login form, uh, to demonstrate that. Um, what you've got at the bottom, you've got a login button, the submit button, um, you've got the remember me checkbox, which is, going to set some cookies to say don't log me out within whatever um, a long length of time. And then you've got the forgot password link. Um, now this this is uh, how it works as you tab through it, the, the source order of the of the of the code. So you've got a login first, which you're probably going to click and you're never going to see remember me, which would which is what you would see if you tab to the next one, or forgot the password if you go to your next one. Um, so those those things are all going to happen after you've already left this page and and submitted the the form. Um, that's how the the code looks. It's not ideal. This 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 uh, link inside the label kind of freaks me out a little bit. Seems a bit unnecessary unnecessary. But this is how Twitter did it. Roughly, I've got rid of a few hundred divs, nested divs, and things as well because there's a lot of that on Twitter's website. Um, starts off with a button. Then you've got the label with the remember me checkbox and then the uh, forgotten password link inside of it. So um, I would solve it by, I mean, I would probably move the forgotten password link somewhere else anyway, but for this 
for this uh, for the, for this demonstration. I would start with the remember me. So that would be the first thing that happens when you when you tab onto this little part of the form. Then it would say forgotten your password. And then it would say log in. So you see those two things before you submit your form. Um, so you've got the opportunity to set that cookie and not have to log in next time you come to the website. And that's done very easily by moving the, the button from the top to the bottom so that then that's the one, two, three, that's the, the way you tab through it and it's that easy. That would put the button on the right hand side. Um, so a little bit of CSS, something like that maybe, just to say, assuming that the form's called got a class of something like a login form, button or type submit, something like that, and then just tell it to float left. Floats might cause problems. You could use Flexbox um, instead, um, but then you've got problems with browser support if you need to get quite, quite deep. Um, Floats might not cause problems. You might not have any issues with things collapsing up, but, but uh, yeah, that's a solution. Another example, match the labels for attribute to its ID. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, so I won't dwell on that for too long. You've got a label there with a for username, and that has the same uh, value as the input ID just after it. So if I was to click or tap the uh, phone name, email or username label, my cursor would be placed inside the input. It's one of those things that you don't have to do it, but it does help things along um, generally and, and adheres to conventions, just makes things much easier. Um, type attributes are nice. Um, these have been around for a long time since uh, HTML5 was a thing. Um, I remember reading Jeremy Keith's book on uh, on an introduction to HTML, uh, HTML5 way back when. I think it might have been one of the first um, a book apart um, publications. Uh, still worth, still very much worth a read if you haven't read it. Um, that's this kind of thing. So what you do is you say on your input, if a text is a text input is a text input, but you might have an email address that you're asking for, in which case, don't give it a type of text, give it a type of email. And if a browser doesn't understand what a type of email is, it just falls back onto type text anyway, so they're going to type text, they're going to get a text keyboard, a, a normal keyboard. The type email keyboard there has a very, or a much smaller space bar, uh, and you've also got an at sign and a full stop, because those are things that you're going to be using in emails, generally, dot com, uh, at, whatever you know so so that's that's kind of there for for convenience um similar thing with type equals url um this is more for urls web web page addresses um you've you've got rid of the space bar altogether here um you've got a full stop you've got a forward slash uh, and then you've got a code.uk thing there i guess that must be tied to your your operating systems uh, regional locality so i guess in america that would be dot com you can hold that down uh, and it'll give you an option of .net, .com, whatever. Uh, other common ones might be might be used. Um, type tell. Um, I, won't get, I won't get into a discussion as, as to why uh, or the differences of type tell and type number. Uh, there are, <laughs> Stephen's smiling at the back there. Um, type tell presents you with this keyboard. It's nice. It's an easy way to type a number. Um, I like type passwords. This is, might be a little bit controversial. Um, I know that there's there are some some accessibility pros to having a, um, a, te a normal text input that you can then toggle show or uh, or not. I mean, you might use JavaScript to do that and toggle the the value of the the type. Um, but I like this because mainly because of iOS twelve. Um, with the new, on the new operating system for iPhones, you've got the, uh, this passwords um, shortcut at the top with the key. What that does is it opens up your keychain and you can choose a password from that if it doesn't already know what it is. Or you can, uh, you can get into 1Password or LastPass uh, if you've set that up in your settings. Very, very useful. If you haven't got that, I suggest you, you, you have, a, have a play. I don't know whether... Yeah, yeah, that is a thing, isn't it? Yeah. Just so easy, isn't it? Just makes it, yeah. It kind of give you, you feel like you're getting more value for money if you from last pass if you yeah that kind of thing. Yeah. 
should just be there. Yeah, the keychain does it for you. It knows what what you would have entered. Um, yeah, um, it gives you the opportunity though if you have like if you've got like several Google accounts or if you've got several. I think I've got a couple of logins to. Uh, I don't know, like Speaker Deck or like one for Front End Northeast, one for myself, that kind of thing. So if you've got multiple logins, it's quite nifty as well. It's a just nice feature. Um, Moving on, uh, try to avoid select elements. I, I'm not keen on these. They're fiddly on mobile. Um, they're, they're fiddly on desktop, but they're a bit better because you can start typing something and it will jump to that later. Um, but generally, if you can get away with the radio button uh, or radio set, um, or if you can use something else a little bit fancier, maybe. Uh, I know I talked about over-engineering things with JavaScript and things before, but this is one situation where you might have a country picker or a, a currency picker or something like that where you can start typing and it's, it brings up some kind of menu where you can select from the shortlist of what you've started to type. Um, but do try and avoid select if you can. Um, not saying don't use it, just not great. Um, place labels above inputs to aid readability. This is more of a design thing where, where you place the labels. Um, this is probably where not to place a label. So what you're doing there is you're reading username when you go into the box and you're zigzagging back to the password and back across. And there might be more zigzagging all the way down the page. That uses more uh, energy than, than simply having what I'll show you in a second. Um, you, you've also got a bit of a disconnect with everything being left aligned there. Um, the different length uh, labels that might start falling down. You know, if you've got a couple of words, three words in there, then you're going to break it onto another line and things start to get a bit messy. Uh, you could make it a little bit tidier by bringing them uh, right aligned so that then the text starts to go out to the left. Um, but you've still got the zigzagging issue. You've still got the um, multiple lines uh, in, the, in the label, less space for them. Uh, I would put them on top like that. So you've got everything in one nice, easy to read row, uh, column, excuse me. Um, everything's in one. It's, it's a quicker thing to, to scan if you're looking at it um, briefly. And there's a very, well, there's lots of resources on Luke Rubliski's website. Um, if you follow that link, you'll be able to have a click through and see um, more about, about that. It's amazing how much detail and um, that kind of thing um, you can go into with that. Um, I'll be posting these slides up on, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet them out tomorrow or something, and, or maybe I'll, 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 I'll let you know, you know. So if anyone wants to find these links and things, they can, they can uh, grab them there. Um, splitting up large forms. Um, this, is a, this is one that, that we do in, um, in government. It's, it's, we ask one thing per page. Um, it's, yeah, that's basically, it might be, several form fields, but it's one thing you're asking somebody. Um, first of all, it reduces the cognitive load um, on the user. Uh, well, in fact, that's pretty much what it does. It's just focusing them on that one thing you're asking them um, and nothing else. No, no, like, oh, I'll come back to that and things. I mean, you can always go back and forward in the browser, but it's good for people with uh, learning difficulties and it's good for your average person on the street because, uh, to give you an example, we did some user research uh, with somebody um, the other uh, the other week. She did warn us that she had uh, a baby, and that, that she was an accountant. And uh, she said, "Oh well, the baby will be there. She'll be fine." Uh, as it happens, sod's law. The baby screamed all the way through, and, uh, and it was it was a it was a tough session. It mainly mainly for her, I think. Uh, we were we were kind of everybody was understand. Most of us are parents uh, in the room, so really, you know how that works. It's a uh, it's a it's a hard uh, it's a hard job, um, but but I think having more than one question per page would have made things more difficult. Um, she 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 was able to just focus on that one thing without without too many you know juggling too many things. Um, another thing that that I uh, would encourage you to do when you're designing your forms is to indicate optional fields um, rather than required fields. This the sort of established standard seems to be to use asterisks. Um, I, 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 they're not a very good idea. I mean, what, what does an asterisk mean? Uh, it means here's a thing, check out what that means below. So you've got to find out what below is, where below is. So you've got to find a key basically to tell you what that asterisk means. 
Um, where does the key go? Does it go to the top of the form? Should be, because uh, then people have read that before they get to the form fields that are required. Uh, but generally it's somewhere buried somewhere down the bottom because this is a convention and people know. What I would do instead, um, I would use uh, the word optional in brackets to say, so that if it's something's required, it's just it's just the label. You're not telling them or asking them anything else. If something's not required, then you're given an optional. Or better yet, only ask for the information you need. Um, why would you ask for something if it's optional? Just ask them for exactly what you want to get from them. Um, this means there'll be fewer options, um, fewer pages to, to, to sift through. Um, you don't ask for stuff you don't need. You're, uh, you're making things shorter for the user um, and also probably covering your backs as far as GDPR is concerned because you shouldn't be asking for things you don't need or storing data that's, uh, that's not necessary. Um, so legally, probably a good idea as well. Um, I think one of my last points is to uh, don't to not override the default browser behavior. Um, this could also be don't complicate or don't overcomplicate things. Um, an example for me is uh, internet banking. When you go to input a new bank account and you've got three little in, uh, little input fields for your sort code, so you've got two numbers in each. I put something in the first one, press tab and it's already tabbed me to the next one, so I end up on the third box, so I've got to tab back, and then start typing. It's a small thing, but it's, it's one of those things that, for me, it, it's always kind of, like, irked a little bit. Um, this blog post here is good, um, from the, the, the government, um, the gov.uk um, design team. Uh, if auto-tabbing stops just a few people from using the service successfully, their needs take priority over the many people who might prefer it, but don't need the feature. So if it's not necessary, don't do it if it's going to be breaking it for any section of your of your users. Um, again, it's one of those things that a lot of people do. Like I've had, I've had, I wouldn't, I was going to say fights. I haven't fought anyone over this. I have had uh, discussions with people um, uh, with this because they enjoy it. But for me, if it's, it's if it's breaking someone else's experience, then it's it's not a good idea. Um, just a few general things to round things off. Um, avoid animation wherever possible. I've made a deliberate decision not to have any animated GIFs or slide transitions or anything like that here. I hope I haven't been clicking through things too quickly. Um, there are a lot of slides. Um, so avoid that wherever possible. That can make people ill. I have a little thing, a little pointer on this. You can see that? The last time I gave this presentation, I, this was new and I got a little bit, uh, I got a little bit carried away. And I, mean, I, I was using that to point at the, the form fields and uh, then I just kept pointing at stuff after that. I just, just pointed and pointed. Um, and I spoke to someone I know very well from uh, who'd come along sh uh, to NUX from uh, from the Northeast. Um, and she was saying that she um, she had to look away whenever I was doing that because it was making her like ill. Um, so yeah, don't do not do animation. Just, just let things happen the way they happen. Um, it's fine and users will, will thank you for it. If you need to use animation, use it, but try and avoid it. Um, make sure your color contrast is good. Um, I have recently softened the, I used to use black on white, uh, thinking that's a good thing for users because color contrast wise, that's gonna be as good as it gets. Um, I've, I've dialed it back a little bit on, on my website in the last few weeks, um, just because uh, you can start to run into some issues with, uh, if you have um, dyslexia, um, if you're looking at, if it's such a stark contrast, the, the things can jump around a little bit more and get more difficult to read. So somewhere shy of, of black and white is, 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 is this kind of the, the sweet spot. Um, I kept this black because I'm on a overhead projection thing and also because I forgot to change it. <laughs> Um, avoid using colors to communicate meaning. Uh, that's probably something that, that a lot of us fall into. Um, use text to communicate meaning. Color means nothing to someone who can't see that color. So if somebody's using a screen reader, if somebody's colorblind, um, oftentimes things can look the same. So you're saying the green thing or the, the, the red thing, it, it's all much of a muchness. Um, just avoid it. Uh, if you want, if you want to, if you want to use some colors, then use it on top of the text, you know, or as well as not on top of, but uh, but yeah, use it as a kind of a belt and braces thing. Um, 
yeah. And that's kind of where you, you end up if you start uh, if you start following some of those rules and, and making things more accessible to people. Um, to sum up, um, think about accessibility from the very start. It's one of those things that you'll learn a little bit more every time you do a new start a new project, um, and it's and it's well worth doing. Bake it in right from the start. Things get quicker, things get uh, easier, and you end up with a much better, more accessible product. Um, typography choices, um, sensible user journeys, uh, user interface patterns, and HTML you use, the CSS you use, um, no JavaScript fallbacks, all that kind of thing. Um, all good. Um, a lot of your design decisions make themselves as a, result, as a result of thinking about accessibility. It's a bit like a pattern library, and you might be using a pattern library as well. Um, but if you've got those limitations and constraints of, of making something accessible, you're not thinking about 10 things or 10 possibilities of the way you're going to design something or code something. You know the way to do it. It might be a choice of one or two. It might just be that there's one way of doing this to do the right thing. Um, and also those constraints can often lead to more creativity and and more interesting things and great design comes from those kind of constraints. Um, and finally, just just think of all those happy users. That's that's the the main thing. Make sure you don't uh, you don't get up anyone's nose with your with your design and your and your code. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, this is this is a, the perfect segue. Um, Stephen's going to talk exactly about about error error messages and, and how they should be done. So I'll not uh, I'll not answer that. Stephen's the Stephen's the man. But, um, and if he doesn't answer your question, you can throw something at him. <laughs> something soft. <laughs> yeah, something soft and not pizza because that'll ruin his t-shirt. <laughs> Um, probably, um, by themselves, probably, um, in conjunction with, uh, with text, a little bit like the color thing, if you're going to use color to communicate meaning, make sure you've got some text there. Um, SVG is a, is a nice way to, to, um, present an icon in an accessible manner. There's a few, few ways you can make an SVG icon, say a, a, a YouTube. Uh, icon there, I don't know, um, that kind of thing. So you can, if that, 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 I think it is an SVG. Um, you can get in there. You can, you can give it a, a title. Um, you can tell, you can use aria, uh, aria, labeled by, aria described by, and you can have things inside the SVG that aren't presented visually, but are accessible to to some, uh, if not most, screen readers. So there are there are ways around it. You don't have to. Abandon icons altogether. Um, just be sure to test things and make sure that that, uh, that they stand up to the yeah to the to the challenge. Really, it's, uh, but yeah, you can you, you can get away with it. Um, but as a gen hard and fast rule, one of those over engineering things as well. Just if you've got a form, just just present them with the the basics. Um, and they'll be fairly relaxed back for it. Yeah, I guess I, I maybe maybe. Yeah. So you 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 you're giving them all the options beforehand, just so that they know what what's what's yeah. available. Yeah, no, that's tr that's true. That was a login form specifically for the. You 
you can tie things together with with aria as well um there's there's ways of doing that that you can that you can give something an id and and, and aria since it escapes me right now, but you, there is a there is a an area attribute you can stick on a, on something, so you can associate two things a bit like you can with the for and the and the ID and a and a normal label and a thing. So it might be that you get away with that one. Um, Uh, I guess just to ask a cheeky favour, uh, I'm uh, I'm not a million miles away from a hundred subscribers. Um, when I get to a hundred, I'm just, this is shameless, isn't it? When I get to a hundred, I get to have a vanity URL so I can change it to Tempo Tempo. Um, at the moment, it's youtube.com forward slash blah. Uh, so I've put a little redirect on my server. So if you type that in, it takes my page. If you subscribe, I would be your best friend forever. So, <laughs> is there any more questions, or or should or shall I let uh, Stephen uh, take the reins and answer the questions on foreign validation? Thank you. Thanks.